Hey everybody, Steve Barsh from Dreamit. Thank you for joining us today for our webinar panel on pricing and the official title, What Price is Right for Startups? We have three great guests that uh, gave their time today and willing to spend some time talking about uh, pricing with us. Before we get started, I just wanna say, uh, during this cohort of Dreamit, so we have 25 companies in this particular cohort that came in, um, this being shot in May 2016. Uh, probably the most common theme when I said to a lot of the startups a little bit more advanced, you know, what's the number one thing that you could get um, out of Dreamit? No pressure for our panelists. Pricing. They said, we're just not exactly sure. Or we asked, like, how'd you set up your price? Like, yeah, we're not exactly sure we could use help with that. So the content I think that we're going to talk about today is going to be super, super helpful. And I know it's, um, you know, every entrepreneur, including myself, always tries to think about what's the right price. So we really appreciate your time. Um, Ari, maybe we could start with you. I was just hoping each of you could just give a one or two minute intro, a short intro. Who are you? What have you done? Uh, what's your background in pricing? And then we'll go around and then get started with some questions. Awesome. Uh, thanks, Steve. And uh, looking forward to having this uh, discussion with, uh, with everyone. Uh, my name is Ari Abacasis. Uh, I am a tech uh, investor and entrepreneur. Uh, having been involved actually with some of the Dreamit companies, including uh, SeatGeek and Adaptly. I served as a venture partner for Dreamit for a while and uh, continue to be a mentor for the program. Uh, today, I uh, am also a co-founder of an acceleration program called Iconic Labs, which is focused uh, exclusively on Israeli tech uh, startups and helping them build their business here in the U.S. market. Uh, in addition to working independently with uh, promising tech startups. Uh, pricing is a very fascinating topic. Uh, I've had the opportunity to do some workshops on it at General Assembly for the last couple of years. Awesome. Uh, um, and uh, really looking forward to kind of hearing the mix we have in the audience and some of the, some of the questions that are on their mind as well uh, as, as, as is on Steve's mind. Okay. Cool. Paul, uh, if you, thank you, Ari. That was interesting. By the way, I don't know if everybody's tuned in or they're watching on the webcast. Uh, out of the 25 companies in this cohort, three are Israeli companies, just to give you an idea. Um, Paul, if you could introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. Thanks. Um, my name is Paul Canetti. I'm the founder and CEO of a company called Maz, M-A-Z. And um, Maz is basically a suite of publishing platform tools we help media companies create apps. And so the same way that you might use WordPress or a CMS like that uh, to create a website, you use Maz for um, native apps for iPhone and Android and now even Apple TV, Apple Watch, whatever it is. Cool. And uh, so, you know, as far as pricing, definitely B2B, um, you know, selling and marketing to, to other businesses is sort of my area of expertise. Prior to founding Maz, I worked at Apple. Uh, I'm a designer by trade, whatever that means. Mm -hmm. And um, I also teach at General Assembly like Ari. And uh, I'm actually later this month uh, going to be teaching at Columbia Business School um, a course on UX and product management. And so um, somewhere between the world of design and enterprise sales lives me. Okay. Very cool. Cool background. David, uh, if I pronounce that correctly, <laughs> you start off the correct way if I'm not pronouncing it correctly, if you could tell us a little about yourself. Yes, um, David Rossi, I'm a co-founder and CEO of Fitbark, which is this little dog activity monitor here. Um, it's, Fitbark is for those who realize that, that dogs and humans need each other to be healthy. It is a fun motivational platform that will get you active together while uh, giving you unprecedented insight into your dog's health and behavior. Uh, so it's not only an exceptionally powerful tool for researchers and veterinarians, but it's also designed and priced so all dog owners have access to clear answers about the health of their pets. Uh, so uh, this is what I've been doing for the past uh, three, four years. We have uh, learned a few things uh, about pricing that have to do with uh, direct to consumer, but also uh, brick and mortar retail, if you will. Uh, we currently distribute to nearly 100 countries. Um, previously, I have some experience to share that has to do with the uh, um, automotive. Uh, <clears throat> I then co-founded a toy cars company, um, eventually a few years in the oil and gas, uh, and then a few years in investment banking, uh, all industries that have uh, very different models for pricing. Okay. Um, and just to ask, by the way, did I read in your background at one point you worked for Ferrari? You said some little toy company, toy car company. Was that, is that different or... 
<laughs> that's that's right. That was my first job. I got my my dream job first, and then and then I got back to reality. <laughs> wow, wow, that's got to be interesting. So you think about Ferrari and Apple. There's two companies that price kind of they don't give their products away for free. That's a good thing. So let, let's start there. Let's talk about, you know, what are some of the best techniques? And we, we do this, we try to be really pragmatic and ask kind of straight to straight questions. You know, what are some of the best techniques that you found to help discover the right price to sell a product? And maybe Ari, maybe this is what you're talking about at General Assembly all the time. It's that, that discovery, you know, what's the biggest number I can say that, that my customer doesn't laugh at me? How do you find that, that right price for the market? What's your experience there? Yeah, that, I think that's a, a top question that, that are in a lot of people's mind, whether you're part of a startup or even a, an established organization coming out with a new product. I think the tendency um, is to initially just look at the competitive set of products that are out there and use those as reference points, and not just the pricing, but the pricing strategy, the pricing models, et cetera, uh, just to be more informed about how you're going to think about pricing. And, and I think this is where we start to digress between B2B and B2C companies and some of the nuances there. But I think in general, uh, what, what's interesting in today's market is that there are a lot more tools and, and processes to discover pricing than there have been in the past, uh, the past. If you think about companies like Procter and Gamble back in the day when they were coming out with, you know, CPG products, what did they do? They generally went to some small town in Ohio, uh, had a, literally a, a focus group of people inside of the meeting and, shared a lot of product marketing pricing uh, topics with them to try to form some kind of consensus, rolled it out maybe in the local market. And if that went well, then they'd roll it out nationally. And that's you know, probably still done <laughs> uh, for a lot of companies. Um, I think for tech companies and for companies kind of in the new economy, you have tools that are available uh, that include everything from crowdfunding you know, campaigns, which are a proxy for market pricing. So Kickstarter, Indiegogo, if you have a tangible product and you're looking to gauge market interest, customer interest, and pricing levels, um, that's a pretty good platform. And you know, Davide, I know Davide Fitpark has had some experience with Kickstarter, which is one of the ways that uh, you know, uh, Fitpark came to the market. Um, the other thing uh, I would just mention is you know, tools like Google advertising, Facebook advertising that provide intention-based and, you know, highly detailed interest-based um, demographics um, are great ways to deploy, you know, modest amounts of budget and do a, what we call do testing, just offer different um, pricing, keep everything else similar and see how the market responds to that and whether indeed there are difference to different pricing offers, pricing levels, et cetera. So th those are a few ways, I think, uh, and a few tools that are available for startups to experiment with. Okay, thanks. The, the, uh, we'll move the question around a little bit. Just a question came in from one of the audience members who said, what do you do if there's no competition to, to test your price against? Or if, and I think you answered that, where you gave some examples if you're using Facebook ads or Google ads and you get your positioning right and then you start press, testing different price points and see intention to purchase. I think there's other, you know, if there is no competitor to benchmark against. I'd love to just uh, make the comment yeah, there's there's always competition. <laughs> it might not be obvious and it may not be direct, mm -hmm. but whatever you're doing, you know, the car competes with the horse and buggy, right? Okay. Um, and put it out of business. So uh, even if you're um, you're doing something that's truly innovative, I, I would say the first thing to check is to make sure that there aren't others doing it. And I would say nine out of ten times there are others doing it. You just haven't found them yet. And in the one out of ten times um, that you are doing something truly innovative. I think try to understand what, what is the substitute, what, what are you substituting? Is mm -hmm. it an entertainment experience? Is, is, is it a business analytics platform? Whatever it is, you're, you're substituting an existing process or experience, which may be worse, mm -hmm. uh, but, 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 but does exist. Interesting. Excuse me, uh, hey, Abby, well, can, you just be, uh, can you just be careful with your uh, camera? You're just moving a lot of great deal, so it's just odd for us in the audience. So I don't know if it's your computer or your see If you could just, uh, just hold tight for us, Ari, when speaking, it would be a great help. Sorry to interrupt. I'm just, I'm just so excited. I can't. <laughs> no, the problem is I bump it. Like sometimes uh, Douglas will come in. Steve, stop bumping against the desk because you're shaking everything. That's my thing. I bump. I I'm done. <laughs> oh, from from desk movement to, to pricing and competition. What any you know tricks, traps that you've learned over your experiences and years, and trying to find you know what's discovering that right price for your product or service. 
Yeah, I mean, it, it, there's two ways to, to really price, um, I guess, any sort of product or, or service, but definitely in the B2B space. Either there is sort of cost-based pricing where you're looking at what are your hard costs. So I'm opening a pizzeria and I have, you know, sort of my fixed costs, like the, my lease and buying the oven and whatever. And then I have the per pizza costs, like the tomato sauce and the cheese and the dough and the labor. And then I figure out, okay, per pizza, what do I have to sell at to make a profit? And then the other kind, which I think is more common, especially in the software world, is value-based pricing. And so it really has nothing to do with me. It's what is the value to the customer? And trying to figure that out uh, while you know, uh, simultaneously pitching them on buying whatever it is you're selling um, was really tricky. And so we experimented with a bunch of things. When, when Maz first hit the scene back um, you know, in 2011, we had a fixed price per app. Mm -hmm. And it was just a tiny fraction. Of one sec, one sec, D David. Yeah. Uh, David, if you're typing, we can hear. It, by the way, if you just go on mute, that. that's okay. Get yeah. Paul. I'm sorry. Uh, you know, to Ari's point, we there were no app platforms at that time. The only alternative was to build a custom app through a custom agency, and so that was our competition. And they were charging okay. hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars. We came out in the single digit thousands. But so the value should have been that that's a great deal. Right. But we found that customers were scared by paying money up front for something that they didn't know about. So actually having no competition worked against us. Hmm. And instead we decided to break it up into a monthly SaaS type fee where, you know, it just was less scary up front, even mm -hmm. though we eventually we settled on a 12 month minimum contract. So mm -hmm. even though the dollar amount actually ended up being the same, there's something psychological about breaking it into subsequent payments and we have managed to creep our prices up over time right um, as we've been able to sort of prove ourselves at the beginning i couldn't give away our product for free literally wow. i was trying uh -huh. desperately to give it away and no one would take it um and now we've been able to bump up our price you know significantly year over year so the average value of a customer has gone up so it's it's really about reading the market um, okay. And what's it worth to your customer as opposed to figuring out how do you cover your costs? Interesting. So let me just to recap that also. So you were trying to give your product away. Nobody would buy it. Then when you put a value on it, you know, you actually could get some traction as long as you put it in the right chunk number, right? It wasn't just, you know, instead of a thousand dollars, it was, you know, you know, 300, 200 a month or a hundred dollars a month. Exactly. Exactly. And, and most recently, sorry if you can hear the sirens okay. in the window. It's great. New York, New York yeah. presentation. Um, yes, exactly. But, uh, but most recently, we came out with a new product. Um, our price points around a thousand dollars a month, and mm -hmm. there are competitors at twenty dollars a month. Mm -hmm. And it really is about choosing who your market is. So, for a big media company, even if that twenty dollar competitor was was better, which they're not, yeah, uh, they would say, "Well, there's got to be a catch. I'm not going to pay twenty dollars a month. I'm." company X, I'm big, I'm important, I need to spend a lot of money on this. Right. Uh, and so really identifying who your buyers are and, mm -hmm. and what they imagine things should cost um, and deciding like, am I the luxury brand? Am right. I the, you know, the Ferrari? Right. Or is this really about being affordable and more utilitarian? Got it. David, you know, your experience with Fitbark and, and finding pricing and discover for pricing, and it, that's a, it sounds like it's a very B2C strategy that you're working on. Yeah, that's what we're doing right now. And uh, I want to encourage anybody who's looking at uh, um, consumer to try to stay as long as they can online because uh, analytics are better, price discovery is better, consumer discovery is better. Um, and if you make a pricing mistake, um, it's, it's much easier to correct that before mm -hmm. you actually have product on the shelves. Mm -hmm. When you have product on the shelves, it gets tricky because you may have a variety of uh, uh, points of sale with uh, literally uh, a product that they uh, ended up overpaying for. So mm -hmm. they just want their money back. Price protection mm -hmm. kicks in. Um, so what we ended up doing with Fitbark is um, first we did a Kickstarter campaign. Um, we actually did it twice because uh, we wanted to test uh, a couple more things. Um, we ended up doing the first Kickstarter campaign with a monthly fee, we killed it. Uh, we reactivated it a few months later. Wait, killed it, killed it as in it didn't work, you shut it down. Remember yes. the startup world, yeah, it. yeah, we're yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. No, we, shut we, we shut down the Kickstarter campaign yeah. okay. and, and then we did it again. <laughs> 
right. with uh, with uh, all the feed that we got from our users. So that was the first, uh, you know, kind of uh, the data point. Um, eventually, when we got when we got a little smarter um, with analytics online, uh, we ended up uh, uh, putting plugins on our um, store. Uh, where we would ask people uh, just a couple of simple questions, you know, um, you're here, you got here because you like this product one way or the other, how much do you want to pay for it? And so the question, the two questions that I asked is what price, at what price does this product uh, uh, become too expensive for you and you just wouldn't look at it? Mm -hmm. And the second question was, uh, at what price does this product feel like a steal or a great deal? And by answering those two questions, you would unlock, you know, a $10 coupon discount or something. Right. Uh, so we got some good statistical analysis. It was kind of a by, by you know, by modal distribution where we were able to eventually Center the pricing at sixty nine ninety five dollars, which is what works well right now. Okay. Yeah. So this is yeah this is what we we learned in the um, you know kind of in the consumer space, and now we're trying to you know realign a little bit uh, with with retailers because the previous pricing was ninety nine dollars. Um, I just want to offer very quickly a couple of other pricing perspectives because mm -hmm. I I think they have nothing to do with this. Um, yeah. Spend some time in investment banking. Uh, it's commoditized. Everybody pays the same fee for 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 similar deals, there's, you know, sliding scales. So the focus is not on pricing, it's just delighting the customer. Mm -hmm. uh, oil and gas, the pricing that I used to do uh, when I was in sales and project management, it was exactly at cost for all projects. So we'd get projects at cost, and then we'd make money um, by, by making claims to our clients uh, for extra costs. That was the profit where it came from. And you know my other experience with toy cars, it's a super mature market. So we knew we had a premium product uh, and it was very easy to just, you know, price it a little higher than competition because folks have plenty of reference reference points. Okay, can I, let me, let me pivot it um, a, a little bit on, on the discussion. You know, we've talked a bunch about B2C, a little bit B2B, but if any of you have experiences on pricing on kind of more of an enterprise sales B2B strategy, something that's, hey, maybe we're going to do an install, it's $10,000, and then on a SaaS model, it's, you know, $30,000 a month. You know, something that it's a little harder to test on a Google AdWords campaign. You can't do a Kickstarter on it, and Ari, I can't think of the examples you gave, but any experiences around that enterprise level selling and setting a price for an enterprise type product? Yeah, maybe um, I can jump in. So, Please. you know, we have over the years been selling to larger and larger organizations and realized that that sort of SaaS model, um, which is semi self-service, the tools are self-service, the sales, I wish was more self-service, uh, you know, sort of falls apart when you get into these really big organizations. Um, again, not because the model inherently doesn't work, but because they are so used to doing sort of more traditional deals Okay. can't wrap their heads around um, a licensing deal. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, um, you know, our sales team has sort of had to learn the ropes there. And, you know, to be frank, a lot of it is pure guesswork. It's okay. just coming in with, we do a lot of research about the companies that, that we sell to. We try to understand, um, you know, what sort of level they're at and basically what they can afford. Um, and also look at how important this particular area is to them. So if we're reading press release after press release about how mobile is so important to company X and they're making tons of acquisitions in the mobile space, we know they value mobile apps a lot. And so when we come in and we say, look, we have the best in breed mobile apps. Well, that's important to you. Then you go to someone else who basically has never even thought about mobile apps. Well, they're not going to put the same sort of premium on it. And so I wish that there was some sort of formula, but really it's about feeling them out. The other thing that we've started doing increasingly is putting people on the spot and asking, what's your budget for this project? Mm -hmm. And they will almost never tell you, mm -hmm. but their reaction uh, can tell you a lot. And so, you know, we'll even throw out things like, you know, are you guys looking to spend a million dollars? You're looking to spend half a million dollars. And if they're just like, what, that's insane. Then obviously we know that that's like not the price. Okay. Um, and that, that could be at any range, right? So you say, look, are you guys looking to spend, you know, a couple of thousand dollars? Are you guys looking to make a real investment um, here? And, and they might not give you a dollar amount, but mm -hmm. the customer will actually tell you what you want to know if you're listening properly. Um, and, 
Yeah. Again, this is definitely firmly in the camp of value pricing. Mm -hmm. It has nothing to do with us covering costs on our end. Um, but you know, different companies could value the same exact product or service mm -hmm. dramatically differently. And right. you can leave money on the table if you assume a sort of common denominator. Okay, Ari, I'm going to steer it over to you. I just wanted to make one quick comment on some of the things you talked about. You know, part of it, the expression sometimes people use is willingness to pay. It's trying to understand the customer's willingness to pay or the WTP and trying to figure out it's almost like a price line, right? What, what is that price line? What yeah. are they budgeted or what are their willingness to pay? Luckily, in the software industry, right, usually you're running at an 80 to 90% gross margin, so it's all profit for the most part. Depends on how you're doing it and commissioning salespeople. Ari, any experience that you've had that different, same for, again, and let, let me just to, to, to clarify here, most of the people on the audience when we're doing this real time live right now, um, and there's people from about four different countries watching while we're doing this live, most of them just, you know, are ed, well, all of them are ed tech and health companies that are watching it live. Health are selling into hospital systems, insurance companies, a lot of them, it's a very enterprise type sales. On the education side, they're selling to large universities, school systems. So they're going to be, a number of them are dealing with this. You know, it's a big number and it's more enterprise. Ari, experience that you've had, your portfolio companies have had, advice you give? Yeah, um, so I guess uh, as it relates to kind of the, the audience, um, it sounds like a lot of the industries that uh, listeners are selling into probably are very much budget driven, um, education, hospitals, et cetera, uh, where in a lot of cases, these budgets are planned for ahead of time and or annual and, you know, obviously the, the, the companies try to stick as close to budget as possible and if they uh, have to move away from that, they have to take money out of one, you know, bucket and put it into, into the other. And, and there are longer sales cycles, generally speaking, I think, for, for these types of uh, go-to-market um, strategies. Uh, the, 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 I think one way to kind of take some of the guesswork out of, um, out of it is it's not rocket science. It's literally... Uh, and I'm working with a couple of companies now on, on doing what, what we call pilots. Uh, and, and just this idea that you're introducing a new product uh, into the market to a business customer. Um, and I think a lot of it is, uh, and, and this is, you know, Paul was talking about listening for the right signals, listening for the right messages. A lot of it is also how you, once you take that in, how you package what you're doing with them. Mm -hmm. uh, and I encourage a lot of entrepreneurs to basically say, hey, listen, you're learning through this process. It's going to change. Mm -hmm. uh, and just set the proper expectations with the early customer mm -hmm. to say, um, you know, we're building out this platform. We're going to have this type of model. We're going to give it to you at a discounted basis for a period of time or, or, or free. Mm -hmm. um, just to get them engaged, get them as a referenceable customer. You know, there are other, obviously, things you want to probably get out of that, those first few relationships, but set the expectation that um, in terms of how long that'll last, what that looks like, et cetera, so that when the time comes, because they are probably going to get value if they stick with you, mm -hmm. you could more easily transition into a paid relationship at that point. Would, so, would you have that discussion about the paid relationship before you start the free trial? Would you set a, a, a high watermark to say, look, if this all works out well, here's where the price is going to be, or do you wait for the trial? What's your experience been? I, I would you know, try to be as, uh, maintain as much flexibility for yourself as the entrepreneur as possible and try not to lock yourself into anything until you have to and, and until you have as much information. So I would just maybe uh, communicate that, that, you know, this is going to be a subscription based mm -hmm. uh, product. Uh, we're, you know, we haven't finalized the pricing yet. It mm -hmm. probably will be in this range. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, when we get to that point, we'll negotiate the final terms and kind of leave it there. And, um, you know, and, and I think in more cases than not, that, that will probably work, you know, from the customer's perspective, there's fairly limited downside. You mm -hmm. know, you, they know you're working hard for them. They know you're uh, giving them something that's very favorable in terms of pricing or, or free or whatever. Um, and you do want them to value you at the end of the day. And that's the most important thing. Right. Um, you know, you, you never want to deal with pricing until you've established the value, right? If you, if you get straight into pricing and discussions, that's generally a pretty uh, tough way <laughs> to start a discussion with a customer. You want them to think, you know, you're, whatever you're offering is differentiated. It's the best thing since sliced bread. And then get to the, get to the point, well, how much, um, 
you know, what, what's your price? How much, how much is the pricing for this? It's a, it's a bit of a easier discussion at that point. And Paul, Paul, your experience. Yeah. Well, I, I just wanted to add to that, you know, sometimes we'll even send a quote with a price and then cross out the price and say, but for you, it's free mm -hmm. instead of just saying it's free because you know, if we're going to throw in a feature or an add on or, or like pilot something like Ari saying so that they do understand there's a real dollar amount here. It's just, mm -hmm. you're not paying it right now because it's okay. very hard to say it's zero and then later say, you know, just kidding. It's more, um, you know, it's like, uh, it's like being in the friend zone. It's very hard to make that a romantic relationship later, you know? Interesting uh, transition. Okay. <laughs> um, no, okay. No, it's interesting. The, the, so, but let me ask, it's interesting because the two of you, um, Ari, something he just said, and Paul, that you just said, they're a little different. You know, Ari was like, we have to, you have to go through the trial so you can really understand the value. Paul, it almost seemed like, look, you need to understand the value up front. And I guess part of it would be, and I don't know if there's a right answer or wrong answer, you know, if you're doing a trial and saying you can use it for free during the trial, are you trying to show them the value or prove the value? Look, you, before you're going to start the trial, like, is this going to work for you? It, it's, and the value, I just wonder, I guess it, it depends, right? You know, that we're saying, here's what the value is. Prove it to yourself. You know, do you disclose that price up front? Because I guess part of my experience, just to interject one opinion here is you don't want to go into a situation where you're expecting that it's going to be $10,000 a month if the trial is successful and they're thinking more $500. It's like, wow, I wish we would have had that discussion three months ago. <laughs> We're not even close here. So it's a, but again, it's a delicate balance when you bring up pricing. David, can I pull you into the conversation a little bit? I just wanted to ask, in your world, it still counts, right? You could do something, we were talking about uh, how do you handle, in a sense, trials and pilots. In the B2C world, right, I could do it with your product because I could say there's a 30-day money-back guarantee. It's almost like a freemium, right? It's, it's $69, but if you don't like it, you can return it, I guess. You know, what, any experience you've had, and in, in, this is more, I guess, the conversations moved to pricing pilots, pricing trials, you know, in, in this company or previous companies. Can I drive a Ferrari off the lot and it's free for the first week? Just kidding. Uh, <laughs> anyway, any no. experience you've had? Yeah, no. So um, I want to say in our case right now, we don't, uh, we don't have a uh, monthly fee model. We don't have a SaaS model. Okay. We, chose to, we do have really meaningful data that uh, food companies, pharmaceutical companies uh, asked us if they can uh, pay us a monthly fee or, or buy it. And we chose to kind of trade that value for amplified distribution, for example, through their channel, right? They help us uh, uh, push the product uh, to their veterinarians, right? So uh, at the end of the day, the choice for, um, you know, even, even um, uh, what the model should be there, it's very different depending on the channel for us. Um, <clears throat> will, will you vary the price based on channel and based on what you'd get out imagine, of the channel? Imagine, imagine uh, you know, Mayo Clinic or University of Pennsylvania or Ohio State or University of Cambridge come to me and they tell me, hey, can I, you know, can we do a few pilots? Uh, can we do a few clinical studies, right? Mm -hmm. how, much, how much do I charge them? My first reaction is, you know, I'm going to give you a product for free, right? right. <laughs> because right. I love to, uh, I love to, uh, for you to write a scientific piece where you mentioned that you use Fitmark as a research, as a research grade tool. Uh, so it, it depends, I want to say. Uh, on the lower end, uh, I'm willing to accept lower pricing from uh, universities, right, uh, from channels that are able to push the scientific value of our product. But mm -hmm. if it's Best Buy or if it's Target um, or if it's Amazon, then I'll try to push hard for my margins. So there's a strategy behind uh, who is able to build um, IP on top of our proprietary uh, IP, uh, they, they get a better price. I, I just wanted to throw in something on, on top yeah. of what Davida said, um, which, which I totally agree with. Like sometimes there's value other than money, mm -hmm. you know? And so, especially when you're starting out, you need those sort of logos to put on your website and you need to be able to name drop in a meeting. Oh, well, you know, Mayo Clinic uses this, like, um, especially when selling to mid tier and lower tier, uh, customers, if you have a couple of those top tier, it's all relative. If you're selling to someone all the way down and you have someone in the middle, that's very impressive. If you're selling right. to someone in the middle, you need someone, you know. Right. Uh, and so, but what I, the only thing I would say sort of on the flip side is I, again, stress that it's very hard to transition someone from a non-paying customer to a paying customer. So for instance, in this research study, 
that's amazing. Mm -hmm. And then you have to know the next time they want to do a study, it's going to be really hard to pull a switcheroo because they're going to say, well, last time it was free. What's the deal? Which Steve is sort of what you were getting at, at right. you know, sort of setting those expectations. Um, like I'll give a really good example without naming the company because I hope that one day they'll, they will be a customer. But um, there was a very big media company, like a big U.S. media company um, that we were working towards doing a deal with a couple of years ago. We were definitely the underdog pitching against sort of the, the bigger corporate type incumbents. And basically they said flat out to us, we'll do it with you if you do it for free. It's going to be great publicity for you. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like Ari, I might have even called you at the time for some soul searching uh, there. And, and, and really we sat on it for, for about a week because it would have been incredible to work with this customer. But we knew that that was basically signing our own like death certificate as far as ever actually working with that customer. Mm -hmm. you know, if there's a chance we ever wanted to have them. So this was almost three years ago. Mm -hmm. Long story short, we're talking to that client again now mm -hmm. about doing a paid deal. Mm -hmm. And I feel like we're better for it because we're coming back a few years wiser and bigger and more established. And now they're taking us seriously. Mm -hmm. But if we had done that free deal back then, we'd still be stuck in that deal with them, you know? Right. Um, and, and I think it'd be hard to make the transition. So you say, you have to decide like, is this person ever going to work with me? If the answer is no, then you might as well get some other value than money. Right. But if there's a chance that they could become a real paying customer, um, then I would actually say some customers you just have to leave and, and build your way up that mountain until mm -hmm. you actually can come to them as like a, as an equal or, you know, and be taken more seriously. It's interesting. Have, have others seen that? I mean, sometimes I think we see dream at companies or any startups that I've seen around the world that, that sometimes a big brand, a big institution, a big university, a big hospital system will, will bully them a little bit on that. Well, give it to us for free. If you want our logo in your deck, give it to us for free. Have you seen that? And then if you're, if you ever go down that route, do you almost say, here's the quid pro quo, fine, we're going to do it, but we're going to write a user success story with you. You know, how do you, it's a, it's a tough thing to unpack, but Ari, have you seen that? David, all of you, have you seen that? And what's your ask? If you're going to go down that rabbit hole, which means there's no money at the bottom of the rabbit hole, what do you want? And do you ask it up front? And do you see this bullying ever going on with startups for the brand? A lot of questions. I apologize. I'll break them down later. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I guess I could jump in. Yeah, um, yeah I, I think Paul uh, really kind of hit the nail on your head on the head you, you have to make a very calculated move i think with those types of discussions because at the end of the day you know you really need to establish value uh, it really does come down to that and you know you have to be careful what you wish for do you necessarily want your first customer to be that gold standard while you're still kind of figuring things out on product pricing marketing mm -hmm. i'm not sure most companies want that not to mention the fact that then you're so super focused on making them happy. They have leverage in the relationship, more leverage than they ever will have. And they could kind of push you in just different directions that take you off course. Mm -hmm. So um, I think those discussions are obviously uh, worthwhile and um, there's value in uh, sharing with the community that you're in discussions with these types of companies. But I, you know, I think entrepreneurs would probably prefer to make all the mistakes with uh, the lower part of that ladder mm -hmm. uh, before um, pitching the value to what ends up being probably an important customer financially and from a value creating perspective. And you, you, you shouldn't want to be so dismissive about giving that up um, early on. So I, I guess, you know, I, I'm of the belief, uh, you know, go after um, the lower hanging fruit that does have some market credibility Mm -hmm. that you can leverage and, and uh, you know, I'm just going to keep on using Paul's analogy here and just kind of work yourself up, you know, up the ladder, mm -hmm. uh, but maintain relationships and make sure you're marketing still to the bigger brands so they know and they track your progress. So mm -hmm. that the next time, whether it's a year later, three months, three years, um, they're like, wow, you guys have come a long way and obviously you're doing something right. Uh, we really need to talk to you. Right. Um, so, you know, be, be careful what you wish for in terms of your first customers. And, try, you know, I would say, you know, m make mistakes where they won't haunt you, you know, longer term. Hmm. It's, it's interesting because I, I think Paul or somebody mentioned it earlier, too. It's almost where you want that 
you have an A, B, or a C customer. So it sounds like you're saying kind of start at the B, don't start at the A, and, and prove things out and, and learn on the B before you go to that A-level customer is what it sounds like you, you're saying. Paul, similar experiences, David, uh, you know, have you had experience in that area? Yeah, so in our case, uh, I want to say that the, the really the B2B relationships uh, uh, and how they're going, it's very cultural. Uh, and doing business uh, with a variety of, of different countries, uh, you really get different responses when you start negotiating pricing. Um, mm -hmm. I'll give you an example. So we're talking about universities. Here in the U.S., you know, one of my initial reactions uh, was, you know, get a couple of units for free and then we'll, we'll negotiate something. But they generally come back to me, and even when I offer a few free units, they um, – tell me they cannot accept them because it would show a conflict of interest in their research. So they really want to pay for it, which is great. Um, right. But then, you know, there's maybe uh, uh, researchers from other countries that reached out, such as uh, my country, which is yeah. Italy, for example. And what we end up doing is negotiating two weeks on pricing, right? <laughs> because right. it's cultural. <laughs> right, right. So, uh, some of that is, 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 you know, is to be expected depending on who you do uh, business with as well. You know, if it's not only... Um, in, in the U.S., for example, but um, it's a bit of a, uh, um, I mean, it, it's, it's a bit of a uh, separate negotiation depending on uh, specifically the value that I can get out of it, right? Uh, I'll give you another example about um, an even different negotiation. It turns out that um, we happen to have a product uh, that uh, is very suitable for doing uh, marketing promotions on the part of pharmaceutical companies or the food manufacturers. Uh, Zaitis, which is Pfizer, twice they did, you know, raffles and, you know, the trade shows and uh, Royal Canine food manufacturer, they did the same. Um, now, a variety of uh, pharmaceutical companies and food manufacturers coming to us because they want to provide, for example, the uh, seasonal gift for the veterinarians, right? Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden you have a chance to ship thousands of units exactly to the people that may become your biggest advocates. Mm. And a third party that wants to pay you for that, right? For sampling to them. Interesting. Okay. okay. Yeah. Right. So I'm gonna be I'm gonna be very, very, you know, it's gonna be an easier negotiation. Right. Got <laughs> I'll it. I'll be happy with with a lower price there. Right. Right. It's interesting. So you've said that before too. You were even saying like if somebody says I want Fitbark for free and I'm gonna do a Mayo Clinic and I'm doing this study or I'm Penn Veterinary, and we're going to do this study and publish, you know, talking about Fitbark, I guess it's what's that value exchange that you're getting besides cash. It's interesting. Paul, any, any comments on, on that last kind of thought or questions or process? Uh, yeah, no, I agree with, with everything that's been said. Um, okay. You know, just one anecdote from my days at Apple, we, we had a product at the time called MobileMe, which is now iCloud. Um, for those of you that remember, originally it was iTools, then it was uh, dot me dot oh. Mac. Then it was mobile me. Now it's like that. And it was actually a paid product. It was $99 a year to use mobile me and it could sync your calendars. You got an email account. Um, you could host websites. You had cloud storage, even though they didn't call it cloud yet. Uh, it, it had all of these things, right? Mm -hmm. Your photos would sync, um, between your Mac and your phone. And it was really cool. And so one of my jobs, during my time there was to create the training materials for the retail staff. Mm -hmm. And so the idea was that they were supposed to attach a mobile me to every computer. So if mm -hmm. I'm selling you a Mac, mm -hmm. I'm should upsell you to the $99 a year because once someone was in that $99 package and you're syncing all your stuff and whatever, there's a very good chance you're going to renew. The problem was that, that at the time the attach rate was very low. The conversion rate was very low. And mm -hmm. it's because people in the stores, the sales reps would basically list every feature. They'd say, and you could do this, 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 and the person would say, I don't know, I don't need all that stuff. It's fine, like, don't worry about it. Right. Instead, the sort of new training methodology was to listen to the customer, mm -hmm. ask the right sorts of questions, and understand what was valuable to them. So if it's mm -hmm. someone that is very busy, has a really active calendar, then you only talk about the calendar syncing functionality. Mm -hmm. You don't even mention the other stuff. So you say there's an amazing service called Mobile Me. It's only $99 a year. It syncs your calendars across all your devices, which at the time was like a novel idea. Right. And, they say, and it has some other stuff too, um, but honestly, it's worth it just for the calendar syncing. And the person is, when they hear that, they're like, oh my God, that's exactly what I need. That one thing, right. it's worth it. Right. And so I tell the same thing to our sales staff here at Maz, like 
it's not about talking about everything you offer. It's really, again, I know I used the word before, it's about listening to the customer mm -hmm. and not only custom tailoring your products, but custom tailoring your pitch to match their exact need and then leaving out basically everything else. You can oversell and shoot yourself in the foot. Um, mm. So it's really zeroing in on, on what the customer needs and then saying, that's exactly what we have. No more, no less. Right. And it's interesting, you're tying back all the pricing, obviously, to, the, you know, is there a compelling value proposition? And then what is the most compelling thing? If you do five things, what's the thing that they're going to attach to and say, that's valuable, that I really need. All right, I saw a couple head nods. I don't know if there's a comment that you wanted to make or, or to add to that. Uh, yeah, th th there was one thing um, I wanted to just add on, on to that, which is I think uh, the tendency for a lot of um, entrepreneurs early on is to overdo pricing or overcomplicate pricing. Uh, I'm sure all of us uh, ar around the table here have seen uh, business plans before where you see five revenue items <laughs> right. uh, in the first you know, six months. And uh, I think the reality is you know, simplicity should rule. Mm -hmm. uh, early days, um, come out with something that's very clear, easy to articulate, sounds reasonable. And as you scale your customers, you're going to have the opportunity to kind of segment your customer base and then segment the pricing mm -hmm. as well. Uh, but you don't, again, you want to do that with, with as much market feedback as possible, which, which will, will happen the more customers that you, uh, that, that you have. Um, you know, if, if you know, you know, you have one core market and then there are potentially other, I think, strata of the market. Mm -hmm. you, know, you see a lot of companies do this on their website. They'll say, here's what we offer. It's $99 uh, a month. Mm -hmm. Everyone else contact us. Right. And, and I think that's a very simple but useful tactic because there, there is going to be others mm -hmm. and offline. You want to have those conversations and, and understand whether there are some patterns there and there's a critical mass there of another segment uh, potentially that you should be addressing. And then you could codify that once you kind of get to the point where it makes sense. So I, I would say, you know, with pricing, you know, the KISS principle probably uh, applies as well. Okay. Uh, and then over time, obviously you could get a lot more creative as, as uh, Paul Mass has done. I think Paul, when you first launched, you had maybe one or two, you know, structures and now you have, you know, uh, it's much more stratified. Yeah. Yeah. I think simplicity is true. And, and as far as the really high end enterprise customers, like Steve, you, you were asking about before, um, mm -hmm. that maybe is pertinent there again, you have to know what they expect to hear, not only as far as the dollar amount, but the structure. So mm -hmm. if you're trying to sell to a startup and you say the pricing super simple, it's X per month, no hidden fees, no nothing. And they're like, okay. yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And then you go to a, a big university or a, a big media conglomerate and you say that and they're like, they're skeptical. Like, of course there are hidden fees. What do you mean there are no hidden <laughs> fees? Like we want to pay hidden fees. And so, um, and so again, we'll use the same sort of mobile me methodology where let's say I have a price in mind. I'm going to charge whatever it is, a thousand dollars a month. Let's just say mm -hmm. to make the numbers even mm -hmm. to the customer. Instead of saying that because it feels like they have no optionality, um, right what I'll do sometimes is again, listening in the conversation, if they really value a particular feature, a particular, um, you know, sort of part of the product, what we'll do is we'll say, you know, the base price mm -hmm. is 750. Mm -hmm. but then here are some add ons you can add. And we, we make sure that the one or two that we know they're going to want a hundred percent from the conversation we just had, right. will still total us to that thousand number. Mm -hmm. um, but it makes it allows you to enter with a lower price mm -hmm. and makes them feel like they're making a choice uh, instead of just coming in. So, so Ari, I agree with you. Simplicity still rules, but, but I actually think that the higher, whatever, up that ladder you go, um, they actually want some sort of autonomy in their decision-making where they feel like they're calling the shots, you mm -hmm. know? Uh, whereas I feel like lower tiered, it's much better. Like even just fundamentally think about it. If you're selling to an organization, you're selling to the CEO because it's a 20 person company, then that's like a totally different sort of sale than a sale where you're selling to someone who then has to pitch it to their boss, who has to pitch it to their boss, who has to bring it to some sort of budgeting committee who brings it to the board. Like how many levels of abstraction um, do you have to get through? Uh, and, and all of that stuff, like understanding the organizational structure of who you're selling to, 
B2B is a pain in the ass. <laughs> um, Guess, by the way, that's where your point, like with your, your Apple example, when the CEO or two levels up the SDP says, wait, why are we doing this? You better have a, that one clear value because if they have to restate the five things, yeah, it's probably pretty right. hard. Let me, let me, I want to turn the conversation and we're going to open it up in about five minutes for questions. I know some people in the audience have questions. The, the, you know, a couple of you said, well, a mistake I see, a mistake I see. I'm, I'm curious, can any of you, you know, what are the most common or biggest mistakes you've seen startups make? It could be you made this mistake or you could just blame it on some other startup. God, they were so stupid. Actually, it was me, but I'm just curious. What do you see as the top two or three most common mistakes you see startups like again and again making? And again, it could be, it could be a, a physical device, David A, what you're doing you know, in your world. What do you guys say? Yeah. Most common things. Here's what's to avoid. So what I, what I would really encourage everybody who is uh, who's doing hardware um, is, is to try to stay as long as they can uh, online. Uh, try to be independent of the retailers because uh, the only way to be successful at retail is to just know exactly what you're doing and everything about your customer. Uh, have plenty of validation that pricing is right. Um, and uh, the truth is that, you know, in our case, we went to retail a little too early. Uh, we have a product that has different values and uh, different people that belong to different customer segments have different willingness to pay. Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example. Um, what if you just spent 500 bucks on a couple of vet bills, now you're spending another $500 because your dog has dermatitis, right? Now I have a tool that allows you to monitor quantitatively nocturnal, nocturnal activity and tells you if your dog's dermatitis is improving, right? How much are you willing to spend, right? Maybe your dog has uh, just done ACL surgery and uh, <laughs> you're really mindful of how he's recovering as, as much as your veterinarian is. Or maybe your dog has separation anxiety and you just spent $1,000 with your trainer, right? Well, then you're willing to pay a little more for this tool that gives you quantitatively exactly that value that you're looking for. Mm -hmm. However, I cannot easily do a five or 10 second pitch about my product if I don't know who you are, right? right. Is if you're a person that spends a hundred dollars at daycare or boarding uh, every day, then you know you're willing to pay a little more than somebody else that just you know that just uh, is is not a, in, in that category. Okay. So well, I'm going to say the mistake that we did is to go to retail too early with a unified message when in fact we should have stayed online a little longer mm -hmm. and done landing page based marketing where first you learn who your audience is. Is mm -hmm. your audience uh, into nutrition? Well, there you go. Fitbark helps you calculate calories. Uh, uh, is your dog, you know, as your dog has a pain management or sickness problem? Well, Fitbark, you know, helps you catch the early signs. So um, really for us, the biggest mistake was really to go to go to retail too early too soon. Uh, and now we've really learned how to how to do uh, marketing specific for that single demographic. Another mistake that I've seen from one of our competitors is to just go straight to market and just like replicate exactly what we've done in terms of pricing, what channels, you know, hoping mm -hmm. to be as successful and, and, and nothing really happened. So mm -hmm. um, at, at the end of the day, it's, it's really, uh, I think it's really about having that daily engagement and conversation and chat with, with your customers uh, rather than looking at competition. Okay. Um, uh, Paul, Ari comments on, you know, the biggest mistakes you see startups making either you've made or other people, you just kind of shake your head and say for the people listening in from dream it and others, you know, don't do this. Just see it again and again. Um, Ari, you want to go? After you, please. <laughs> so, uh, I've made a lot of mistakes. So I was thinking about my list here. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this is a two part mistake. That, um, and, and it's not really about pricing per se, but it's more about mistakenly thinking that what you're building is a product. Um, and what I mean by that is that you can get so attached to what you're building and then you spend the t all the time after that basically chasing a customer. Mm -hmm. um, there must be a customer that exists that wants what I have. Right. Instead of thinking, who is the customer? What do they need? And how can I build something for them? And most customers are moving targets. So even if you identify a need today, if you want that person to continue to be a customer ongoing, this is true B2B or B2C, 
you have to sort of move with them through their life, uh, both as individuals, as organizations, and like in the macro world of just trends and things that happen over time. And so um, I think listening to your customer above all else and understanding that what you're building is a company and the company creates products and services to, to fit the needs of customers, whoever those customers are, mm -hmm. that's how you should view every day. You're not building the product, you're building sort of the framework to create products over time. Uh, and and it's, a, it's a subtle distinction, but it really, really matters. It matters as far as motivating a team. It matters as far as dealing with failure mm -hmm. um, and understanding that this product didn't work the way we thought, but that's okay because we are more than just a product. Right. Um, part two of that mistake is listening to your customers literally. Um, you know, there's that famous quote, uh, a Henry Ford quote, if we ask the people what they want, they would have said faster horses. Right. right? Are you touched on, on the horse and buggy thing? But, by the way, I saw a quote yesterday from Elon Musk. Apparently, Chris Freilich from First Round Capital tweeted that Elon Musk said if you ask people what they wanted, Elon Musk would say faster Porsches. But anyway, so. <laughs> <laughs> I never heard that before. That was good. Anyway, I'm sorry. That's, that's pretty amazing. Yeah, it was. Okay, so faster yeah. horses in, if you listen to In your every customer. age. Yeah. Right. yeah. But it's about getting at the why. Like, what are the underlying things? That, and actually, Elon Musk talks about this a lot, about mm -hmm. sort of looking at first principles. Mm -hmm. Like, why does someone want the thing they want? You know, I spoke to some folks at Unilever recently. Mm -hmm. You know, they make soap and, and Axe body spray. They also own Ben and Jerry's randomly, which I didn't know. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, we were talking about first principles and that how do you improve upon soap, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and you might think, well, you make a soap that lasts longer, that gets you cleaner or whatever. But the, the real need of the customer is to get clean. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily to use soap. Mm -hmm. And so even just assuming that a better soap would beat the current soap, you're not going deep enough into the customer needs. And so when you listen to your customer, don't just take it at face value, but really find out like what, what's the driving motivation behind those requests okay. and can I solve them on sort of a deeper, more fundamental level um, instead of, again, just chasing my original idea and hoping that eventually I find a customer that fits. Okay, Ari, quickly, and then we'll, we'll open it up for questions. There are a whole bunch of questions. Um, most common mistakes you see startups make, you know, you're an investor, you're an entrepreneur. What have you seen that are, please two, don't do this. Two, two quick things I would just mention. One is uh, just because you have the lower cost, don't think you'll win. Okay. Um, even if you have a comparable product, understand why the competitive product sells at what they sell. And they may be trying and succeeding at differentiating on something completely different, mm -hmm. customer service, a feature, function, whatever it is. Uh, that's one. I would say the second one is, uh, you know, pricing uh, should not only be evaluated upon the introduction of a product. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is a message I think you're hearing from Paul and Davide. It's, it's ongoing. It's, it's dynamic. It's fluid. It's variables change, right? Markets change. Customers change. Mm -hmm products change, consumer behavior changes. Right. And it's something that you have to constantly monitor, mm -hmm. uh, which is easier said than done because day to day, you're, you know, your company's um, involved in a lot of different things. Plus, if you think about it, there's no such thing as a chief pricing officer, right? Um, it's one of those, I think, functions that kind of is blended in there somewhere uh, and has to be called out or teased out of the organization. And, really should be treated as a, uh, as, as, you know, a, a subject matter onto its own. So just ongoing monitoring of pricing and whether, you know, you've got the right pricing or should introduce different pricing, et cetera, it, it never ends. Okay. And it, just when you said, you know, be careful of pricing just based on what your competition is doing. An interesting note, years ago, I, I was meeting and had a chat with Brett, who at the time was CEO of Bizarre Voice. I said, oh, how are things going? He goes, yeah, not so well. We have a new competitor that I think they eventually acquired, but called Power Reviews. Well, what's the problem? Well, we're, you know, $50,000 or $100,000 a you. Power Reviews is zero. It's absolutely free. And by the way, they'd still win deals, right? And people would pay to use Bizarre Voice versus Power Reviews for free. And it was all at that point, what's the value proposition? Why is it compelling? And really talk about having to outsell and really explain some key differentiators when you're competing against free and you're trying to charge. I think that's the ultimate, uh, what, careful what, if you're pricing. So 
um, on how you price. So we have our first uh, uh, person with a question from the audience, Vitter from Dreamit, who's a Dreamit health company. Go ahead, what's your question? Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, gentlemen, for this wonderful uh, webinar. So I'm Vidur from Keratin. We are automating pumped breast milk management for neonatal ICUs, and hospitals are going to be our primary customers. They're going to pay us. We have, I have two questions here. So part of our value prop is that we save nursing hours, which are currently wasted on handling milk bottles. They can now provide better critical care. So it's a very qualitative value add. How do we quantify it to a metric so that we can ask for money on that value? The second part of the question is, uh, there is an absolute value as well that we can ensure uh, premature babies are there they go back home sooner so that is basically a lot of money saved for the hospital which is right now charging a flat fee per NICU or neonatal icu baby and we can save that money so let's say we save x dollars to the hospital what part of that x dollars can we charge to the hospital uh, after we have adjusted for our costs Okay, so and then let me just restate the question. So the question, I think part of it, or a lot of it was around, can we capture a piece of the savings? Is, is, can, you, can you price that way? Uh, anybody want to take the question? Ari, you're off mute. I don't know if you want to take uh, it. Uh, sure. <laughs> um, you know, th those models, I think, um, sound very tempting and compelling and make it sound as though there's very like low risk associated with it. I think it's a, it's a tough way to scale though, and it's a tough way to make money if you could avoid it. I think it's the opposite coin, quite frankly, of establishing value, right? Uh, and it's just another way of saying, hey, listen, if I could you know, save you 50% today, give me 20 of that 50% to prove that it's worthwhile. And there's certainly businesses and industries that work that way. You know, Performance-based advertising is a, a, a pretty prominent one. Right. Um, I, I would say if the industry is, has that um, cons buying behavior already and that's entrenched, then you, know, you may have to go with the flow. If, you're, um, if, if it's not already entrenched in the industry, I, I think there are other ways you could probably establish that value and have them pay for it upfront without always kind of putting the onus uh, on uh, you know, the, 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 the value savings. Um, yeah, you know, there, there are complications also associated with that type of process, pricing model because value saved by customer one versus customer two could be very different. Just to, yeah, just, just to add in, so we run into this problem a lot because um, long story short, if you use Maz versus many of our competitors, even like the really big competitors like Adobe, um, it's not that we're only competing on, on our price versus their price, but our software is so much easier to use that you save a ton of money in manpower. Like you, you need very little staff to use our tools, whereas in some cases you need multiple employees, sometimes even 20 or 30 full-time employees to use these other software solutions. So you would think it's a great pitch. You say, you come in you say, look, you could basically fire all these people and save a lot of money, which I feel bad about that part, but whatever, it's, right? Mm -hmm. Um, the problem is that you have to know, are, are you looking at, is who you're selling to responsible for both those budgets? Um, because the response that we get a lot of times, whoever we're selling to is the software budget people. And they say, well, I have nothing to do with payroll. Like it doesn't matter if you save money in payroll because that's not my purview. Now, of course that's, that's maddening because it's the same company. Don't you want to save money for your company? Mm -hmm. That's not how a lot of this stuff works. So within the hospital space, unless you're selling really high up in the chain, you want to make sure that whoever you're talking to is responsible for all these different areas. The other thing is I agree with Ari. It's very, it's very difficult to sell essentially negative value as a, as a good thing, like playing golf where the score, a low score is good, you know? Um, and it's much better to sell positive value and sort of aspirational value. And so I would just shift your pitch and say it increases productivity 30% or whatever it is, instead of it decreases unproductivity. Oh. It's a subtle, yeah. it's the same thing, but it turns your, your metric into a positive number instead of a negative number. That makes so much sense. Thank you. It's interesting. Let me just, uh, I want to add a quick comment and we'll take another question. A couple of experiences I've had with this. The other challenge sometimes is that are with the model where you're going to do it flexing based on savings or productivity. A lot of times large organizations have to budget 
So wait, it could be $10,000 next month or it could be $80,000. I have no idea. So it, it, they lose their ability to budget and forecast because they want to budget. Um, and the other challenge I think that you have in those types of models that I've seen is that, well, wait a second, we made three changes in the NICU. How do we know that productivity or that savings was directly related to you? So maybe you go about it saying, look, our studies show that it should save $40,000 a month. We only charge $10,000 a month if you look at the value and then it's fixed and it's done. And so just as my thought. Um, any other questions from the audience? If there's anybody else that wants to come up and I'll just look, there's some stuff in Q&A and chat. Uh, that's gone. Okay, that, hold on. Let me just look in chat. There were a couple of questions. Uh, we talked about the competitor. We talked about that. Let me just see if there's anything else on my list. Anything else that, that we're just about out, and I think Ari had to drop off right at 2 o'clock Eastern time. Um, other comments or things when just for, for David Day and, and Paul, other things that you want to add, tricks, traps, pragmatics, you know, for, particularly if you're an early stage entrepreneur, you know, here's some last parting thoughts that you have. Um, I just want to say, you know, one of the uh, one of the things that I was dreading the most, uh, uh, which was supporting the customer. Uh, what a lot of companies, especially corporations, think of as as a cost center. Uh, we were able to literally turn it into our uh, in, in, into a great source of information. Uh, chatting every day with your customers physically on chat, um, mm -hmm. it really has helped us discover what they think, set our software roadmap. And so uh, turn the way people think of, of even writing reviews for you, because we have had people that never wrote a review really feel like they had to leave one for us. And so um, it's a great way. Uh, I mean, customer support is really changing. Uh, uh, somebody thinks we're going to move to AI for some of that, uh, maybe, you know, a fraction of that. But it has turned out to be the greatest uh, uh, opportunity to learn uh, and communicate uh, and really make sure that um, we know what's what's on their mind. So that has also been fabulous in, in kind of driving the roadmap, not only for software, but also for strategy and pricing. Interesting. Paul, co closing comments, tricks, traps, pragmatics, other things, you know, words of wisdom on pricing. Sure. Um, you know, I guess my closing whatever advice is to treat business model and pricing like with as much attention as you um, treat the actual product. You know, um, these are all different pieces of your business that have to come together perfectly to succeed. And so no single piece is sort of the, the end all be all. But sometimes you could have the exact right product and have the exact right market that you're trying to sell to, but the price is wrong. Mm -hmm. And the price is right, but it's distributed wrong, like I found with an upfront versus a SaaS model. Um, mm -hmm. And so just remaining flexible and, and experimenting and trying different things and understanding that, that pricing and ultimately your business model, and the two are very closely tied, is, is just another lever. It's not the only lever, but it also shouldn't be the last thing you do. Like, especially if you're a technical type founder. Um, I know a lot of companies that got all the ground, got all the way to sort of launch day. And then we're like, great. Now how, what should we, what should we charge? Or like, how should we, you know, how should we talk about value or whatever it is? Instead, I would really start that at the beginning of the process and make it something you do in tandem with the rest of the processes you have product marketing, whatever. Um, yeah. And, and just that there's actually a great post. Fred Wilson wrote a post recently, um, about that. We're basically like, I forget the exact name of the post, but it's like business model as the product mm -hmm. and, and where you could even have one company that succeeded and one company that failed that were essentially doing the exact same thing, but had a different model, uh, and how that can dramatically change the outcome. For a moment there, I thought you were going to say, by the way, not just product market fit, but you need price market fit, right? There's lots Ooh. of different fits that you need. That, so. I, price market fit, you should like, you know, copyright that or there something. That's we'll pretty good. On, we'll put it on a tweet. Guys, I really appreciate everyone's time today. Thank you for the dream of people that stuck in for watching it live. We'll wind up posting this on our YouTube channel. We'll blog it as well. We really appreciate your time today and sharing your wisdom on pricing. We're going to drop off now. Um, Douglas, thanks for, for getting everything together and producing. And thanks so much. We appreciate all your comments and thanks for everybody's questions. Have a good afternoon. Have a good thanks, day. everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye.